Uh, my name is Kira Colburn. I'm head of platform here at Workbench. And for those of you who don't know us, we are an enterprise software VC based here in New York City. I'm actually in Hoboken, New Jersey today. Um, and we lead seed rounds and enterprise startups throughout the country. But the number one thing we work on with our founders is enterprise sales and go to market seriously all day, every day. And that is why we launched this masterclass series um, with operators and execs to share their most tactical playbooks. So we really know that in today's challenging market, every sales opportunity is being stress test and put under scrutiny. So many early stage founders are struggling to get an accurate read on their quarter and especially one that they can take to their board. And unfortunately, too often we see deals fall through end of quarter. So that's why today we're going to give you a framework to better qualify and forecast your opportunities so that you can hit your quarter's targets. And this is where Kieran Narsu comes in. Kieran is a longtime revenue leader in New York City at both large companies and fast growth startups. Also, not to confuse you with our names, Kira and Kieran, this happens very often to us. <laughs> Um, but he's going to walk you through the most common challenges he sees in managing and forecasting deals. Uh, prepare to take notes, even take some screenshots. I promise you we have a lot in store. Um, but don't worry if you miss anything. We record this and we're going to post both the recording and the slides on our blog afterwards. And uh, I see some people already putting their introductions in the chat. Feel free to keep doing that. And then also we're going to get through uh, a bunch of Q&A afterwards. So please drop any questions throughout in the chat and we will get to them. And with that, Kieran, I'll hand it on over to you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Kira, for that great introduction. And it's great to see everybody again, although I actually can't see you. Uh, and I apologize, my dog has decided to go bonkers at this exact moment. So sorry about the background noise. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, and while I'm doing that, first of all, thank you all for joining. I think in this session, I'm going to be sharing a lot of opinions. Uh, these are certainly not facts, and there's probably some amazing sales and revenue leaders on this call as well, and would welcome all the input and, and uh, ideas from this group as well. Uh, let me go ahead and bring up uh, the content, and we can kind of dive in. Uh, so as, as Kira mentioned, I spend a lot of time, uh, and I've spent a lot of time the last several years working closely with uh, workbench and other portfolio companies in the seed and, and A stages. So a lot of advice is coming from sort of the things that I see in, in engaging with them. So really the the you know the the target audience for this is this is not by any means to restrict the value of, of what I'm hoping to share here today, but uh, organizations where you've got some semblance or signs of early repeatability, uh, you've got a more sales-led go-to-market where the ACB might be at a little bit on the higher side, um, and you've got a reasonable understanding of who your target market is. Obviously, there's always a wiggle room on all of these, um, and ideally, you've got some go-to-market machinery set up and in place, uh, as well as the support of a marketing function or team, um, and you're working a pipeline of opportunities. And ideally, you're just looking to get better clarity on how to wrap your arms better around the deals that you've got in, in play and, and really optimize them for closure. Obviously, everyone's definition of product market fit is different, so this is not, uh, this is not gospel by any means. So as far as today, what ideally we want to talk about is how can we create a framework to better assess the stuff that's in our pipeline? How can we forecast a little bit more accurately? How can we uh, reflect the unique aspects of what we're selling in a, a set of stages that are then consistently used so that we can run cadence and rigor with more discipline around um, those, those consistent norms? And I'm a big believer, and you'll, you'll hear this a lot from me, is this sort of culture of real. And what I mean by that is let's 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 be real about what's in our pipeline. Let's, let's be real about where we are with deals and the risks that we face in them so that we can really better assign the resources. The number one issue here is the resources are very scarce in, in most organizations. Uh, we just never have enough help. Uh, so we've got to be we've got to be very careful of the resources that we apply on deals. Um, I'm a, also a big believer in having a consistent lens by which we look at opportunities so that we can better resource them. Um, and so that we can ultimately get, get closer to one of those key steps to, to win. So 
I don't think <laughs> I don't think I need to spend too much time on this slide. Uh, the market's a little bit of a mess. Deals are taking longer. Decisions are needing to go up higher in organizations. Uh, budgets being cut, being pulled, what have you. So look, rigor around deals has never been has really been never been more important. Uh, so I don't really have much more to add to that. But uh, the discipline around uh, how we sell and how we uh, prioritize resource deals is, has never been more important. And sellers just have to execute at a very high level to be effective. So I talked a little bit about foundation a few minutes ago. Let me kind of describe what I think about it is. So as you know, as you're thinking about and building this thing out, uh, one critical area to start is, is are we clear on what are the steps in our sales process and do they reflect the uniqueness of what it is that we're selling, the market we're selling into? Is it a highly competitive market with lots of vendors and we have to stand up above the crowd? Is it more of a, you know, it's a newer market or a new way of doing things and we have to reflect that in our sales stages. Um, once we have those, we'll talk a little bit more about setting up this cadence. And when I talk about a cadence, it's a calendarization of deal vetting rigor that allows people to get comfortable with a consistent way of looking at and prioritizing opportunities. Um, running it means actually doing it, uh, following through on it, uh, making sure that each individual participant in the stack is doing his or her uh, main duties. Like if you're an AE, you're scrubbing your deals, you're managing your pipeline, uh, and you're doing it without exception. But also looking for places where we see common threads, like, you know what, this, you know, we have fallen shy on competitive differentiation against this particular sector or what have you and finding those gaps and making those improvements uh, every step of the way. So when uh, let's take this one at a time and let's take, uh, uh, you know, let's let's start with the stages. So, you know, if I'm a if I'm a company uh, in large companies, small companies, I think we can see fairly consistently there's a usually a pretty high threshold for change. There's usually something that's not going right i.e. a problem or a pain that, that needs to be changed. So organizations that are vetting whether they need to do that are thinking about, well, what is the problem? Do we, you know, can we sort of limp along with what we have today? Um, what, you know, what will, what benefits will we incur if we do make a change here? And if there's a problem that can be solved through technology and software, how much will this change cost? So then they go through the stages of that sort of decision life cycle, right? Evaluate the different alternatives, look at their costs, look at their capabilities. And then as they get through and closer to making selection, they start to look at the risk inherent in the decision and making sure that if they do pull the trigger on a particular product or service, that it's, it's actually gonna meet the needs that they lay out. Um, and you know, as a seller, the more we're aligned with where our buyers are in that cycle, uh, believe it or not, the more we can actually influence them, the more we can sort of nudge them to the right, if you will, uh, so that, you know, if they're in the earlier stages, we want to paint that art of the possible picture, right? We want to be able to describe that we can do, uh, we can do it. Then we might lay out criteria about how we can prove that during phase two. Maybe it's a trial or a, or a pilot or some other limited engagement that gives them the ability to, to, to justify that they, that we can address their challenges better than the alternatives that they're looking at. And then closing the deal, right? negotiating it, closing it, um, sort of answering those remaining questions. So seller stages uh, can be sort of thought of as uh, developing of needs, proving out the value and negotiating and closing. And outcomes like this, again, this is just one example. There's a ton of sales uh, methodologies out there, all of which are terrific, spin selling, uh, you know, uh, command of the message. There's some amazing uh, uh, models. This is just one example, but the idea being is that the sales stages have to measure uh, and validate outcomes so that we can know that we have gotten to a specific state in the opportunities. And I think that is a big key for uh, setting up the sales stages. We could then say, all right, well, we've got agreement from a stakeholder. Well, we now can move into this value justification stage. Uh, if we've exited that stage, 
uh, and we've reached the outcomes there, we might be in a position where we can start negotiating, et cetera, et cetera. And once we have these in place, we can start to build out a level of, of cadence. And uh, you know, one of the things that I spent a lot of time with startups on is setting this up, but also operationalizing it. And I wanna go through each of these in, in turn. Um, once we're clear on the stages and the value of uh, you know, a particular opportunity at its stage and the outcomes that we're seeking, the AE has to look with a high degree of uh, criticality, really, uh, uh, on the stages, updating the, the, doing the basic locking and tackling, updating the stages, close dates, values, next action. You can think of this in, in some ways as sort of a, almost like a continuous sort of scrubbing, right? Um, and so that, you know, a good example is, do I see deals that have a closed date of next week that are in the early stage of the sales cycle? That's obviously wrong, right? We want to minimize and eliminate those, those chances or likelihoods. Um, similarly, uh, we want to start to get a view for which of the deals are going to start to frame my quarter as an individual AE and the bubbling those up to get visibility within the organization. We'll talk about that when we, when we cover forecasting in a minute. Um, the next level of sort of vetting, in my experience, has been a really good deep dive deal review. And we'll talk at length about what I mean when I say a deal review, but a deal review is very much looking under the stones at opportunities and looking for potential gaps in our coverage or our understanding of our standing in the opportunity uh, so that we can take corrective action, both as a seller and as sales management, et cetera. Um, a forecast call is also something that we want to run on a regular basis, and this is looking at forecasted deals. Now, it may be that um, a pipeline call and a forecast call can be combined. There's all sorts of various permutations of this, but the idea is forecasted opportunities whereby the seller and or his or her leader are saying, this deal is going to happen in this time period, i.e. this quarter or this month are reviewed so that we can assess, are we really going to hit that? Are we on the glide path to closure for this particular deal? Uh, and what do we need to do in order to make sure that we are if, if there's a gap? And the idea that we're, we want to get to with this kind of a structure is by the time the CEO goes in front of the board, he or she has gotten a level of comfort and confidence in the deals that are projected by his or her leadership uh, with respect to the ones that we're, we're, we're going to the board and saying we're going to close in this time period. Um, and obviously, in that case, there may be cha changes to forecasted opportunities from a sales leader to the CEO, where we might go, you know what, I, I don't think we're there yet on X or Y or Z. And I'm going to cover that in, in just a minute uh, with, some, with some examples that will give you a sense of it. Another view of this is sort of a calendar view. So if you think about the weeks in, uh, that make up a quarter, um, our AEs are rigorously updating their pipeline. Maybe they're meeting with their peers to, to do some scrubbing. Maybe they're meeting with their sales manager, um, if it's not the CEO, to do that. Uh, and then a sales leader or VP is running deal reviews with the AE. Sometimes the CEO may sit down on those or other, other functions, but these are not updates to management. These are deep dive introspection on, on selected deals in the pipeline. Some that are forecasted, some that may not be. And then a regular cadence around forecasting so that by the time we get, get up to here and whatever communication mechanisms the, the leadership has with their board uh, can reflect that reality as, as closely as possible. So let's talk a little bit about what I mean by forecasting. So many of you have been doing this for probably at least as long, if not longer than I do, know that you know there's the pipeline, which is the, the universe of opportunities that a given sales team is working on at any moment. And then there's the forecast, which is a time-bound uh, projection of future outcomes based upon a subset of that pipeline. I'm a big believer in having consistent, rigorous criteria that determine whether a forecast, a deal is forecastable or not. And I usually get, recommend between two or three categories of forecast. So let's take a look at the, the most advanced category of forecast. This would be commit. So if I'm committing a deal as a rep or maybe as that rep's manager, 
I want to know that we've been confirmed VOC, which stands for vendor of choice, that this organization is going to do something. And I can vet and validate that that is the case, either from champions or executive stakeholders that I'm working for or both, working with or both, that we have some agreement on the commercials, the cost of our offering. Uh, we've either started or finished the legal T's and C's. We know why the organization is going to take action now as opposed to kicking a can down the road. We have already been vetted, you know, selected above our competitive approaches. We also know what they have to do internally to actually get signatures. Uh, who's the signing authority, what's the internal signing process, where does it go from A to B to C person, uh, in what order, and that those folks are available within the time frame we're trying to get this deal done. Um, if I'm falling short on, on any one of those steps, maybe I don't commit it, but it's still like it's very solidly on the glide path. We've already been selected, but we don't have the process started on legal T's and C's. So maybe it might be a stretch to pull it in in this quarter, for example, especially if there's only, say, a few weeks left, like uh, many of you are on a quarter that ends at the end of this month. Um, in which case, I might call it upside, or you could use the term stretch if you like. Uh, it's another term that's quite commonly used. Um, maybe we actually haven't been selected yet. And if we haven't been selected yet, but We've gotten stakeholder buy-in. We've gotten executive stakeholder buy-in. Look, you guys are blowing away the competition. You're way better than the build option, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we're going with you. We just have to dot a few more I's internally, get a few stakeholders aligned. Um, I may not be confident enough to, to call that an upside deal yet. So I might put that into another category of forecast called stretch. Um, and if it's stretch, it's usually earlier in the sales cycle, but as a seller or as a sales manager, I might want to raise the visibility that this deal is heating up. I'm seeing all of the right level of urgency and visions aligned around our product or service being the best choice. We're seeing the kind of traction that all of you who sell know what I'm talking about. There's this constant and increasing level and flow of information between the teams. Um, we're starting to get a better signal of their timing. But even so, I might not decide that that's forecastable yet. And by the way, these are three categories of forecasting. You may only need two, right? You might just say commit and upside, and that's it. And we, you know, everything else is what I would call pipeline, right? So pipeline is exactly that. We're not forecasting it because we don't know the timing yet. We haven't validated that they are going to take action in, in solving this problem. Uh, we don't know all of the stakeholders. We're still building out the relationship map, which I'm going to talk a little bit about in a minute. Um, but we fundamentally have a feeling that this one is moving, but uh, you know, feelings don't pay the bill and, and pay commission checks. So we've got a, a lot more work as sellers to do to develop this opportunity. So th hopefully this is a helpful way to think about the two in context. And again, the, the consistent theme is evidence based on stage definitions, based upon outcomes from those stage definitions that allow you to make a, a, a as much of a fact and database decision about what to commit uh, as is possible with, a, with an otherwise sort of binary concept. So I touched on this earlier, but some of the things that, that you know, there are assets, and I'm going to share with you some of the templates that, that I've developed and that I've used or, or you know, quite, quite commonly in the public domain. Obviously, consistency around categories uh, forecasting, right? The deal review as a process, and we'll talk a lot more about that in a moment. Um, a big believer in power maps or stakeholder maps, especially if you sell a product that requires consensus in order for the organization to buy, um, looking for ways to detect urgency signals. And many of you may have participated in a workshop I ran uh, a couple months ago on discovery and upping our discovery. Um, and we talked a little bit about urgency signals. I'll flash some of that up as well. And at the last, of course, rigorous updates from the seller. So what do I mean by rigorous updates from the seller? Uh, here's what I mean. <laughs> um, all too often, an AE might be holding on to something that's been sort of stuck in a stage for a long time. Um, and there may be good reasons for that. But fundamentally, we have to ask tough questions. Is it really just a push deal in disguise? 
Uh, and if it is, and you heard interest, but they've gone silent or, or some other things have changed and it, you, we're just not getting engaged, there's no harm in, in killing it. That doesn't mean you can't, as a seller, keep working those individuals and developing the urgency and developing an understanding of what, what they need. But there's no sense in sort of, you know, confusing the pipeline with it. Uh, similarly, with signals around urgency, um, if, if you're not sensing that they're going to act because they're okay limping along with what they have, it's not a deal, and that's okay. Uh, we just have to be real, you know, facing reality. And if that means as an AE, your pipeline looks a lot leaner, well, at least it's now reflecting what you're actually working on that you can bring to bring to fruition. Uh, and similarly, just all the, the tactical stuff that we've got to be cognizant of, because when we as sellers, sales leaders, marketers, or CEOs start to generate reports and we see close dates that don't look consistent, it just, it just makes our jobs a lot difficult, more difficult. So that level of, of, of constant rigor around keeping those accurate is really important. Um, I'm, a, I'm also a big believer that having a core team of maybe it's sellers, sellers with the sales manager, maybe even the CEO, just meeting on a regular basis to look at that and maybe make the scrubbing activity kind of a, um, a, a mutual kind of a team-based uh, event and do it on a regular basis. Um, so I think those are some of the key things that that can help us to do this. So let's uh, let's talk about uh, deal reviews for a minute. Um, those of you who do this probably apply a lot of different metrics. There are terrific tools like Medic out there, uh, you know, that establish a framework and an acronym that says these these are the things we want to look for. Those work phenomenal. This is really just another variation of that. But what I, what I like to think about is assessing an opportunity. And by the way, we can assess a deal, whether it's been forecasted or maybe even if it's not yet been forecasted along a few different axes. The first one to me is always, why will the organization act? What is the problem they're trying to solve? How severe is it? How, how you know untenable is limping along with what they have today? Uh, and expressed as another way, you know, what happens if they don't take action, right? And more often than not, sellers with a incomplete understanding of this will end up seeing deals slip out and maybe not even recognizing their own ability to influence that urgency. And, and I believe, obviously it depends on a lot of factors, but I believe as sellers, we can, and we can do that a lot. So uh, really zeroing in on how, how we're covered on an opportunity with respect to that. Sponsors. Um, another problem I run into with, you know, my days of leading sales and running sales and also advising is we end up being, uh, you know, very single threaded with an individual, you know, he or she is, loves our product. He's, really enthusiastic about our service, our product offering, um, but isn't fundamentally getting us in front of other people that we know will have to be involved. Go back to slide two, which is, look, budgets are being cut, but also decisions are being pushed up into the senior levels, even for smaller spend amounts. So if we are working with, a, uh, as a good friend of mine calls, a junior woodchuck, a, you know, a, a, a junior individual, then uh, that we know can't get the deal done, then what are we doing to plug those gaps? And I'll talk about some tools that we can use to get a better understanding of that when I give an example. Um, do we understand how the organizations buy? And also as a related question, do we understand how the individuals that we're selling to are aware of it? Uh, more often than not, the people we're selling to are first time buyers of software products, in which case they themselves have to go do homework to figure out, okay, well, what's the spend threshold? Who else has to sign off? What is the internal technology or other vetting process for new vendors, blah, 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 blah. So um, our ability to assess the deal, you know, when I'm looking at a seller, I want to see that he or she understands that, you know, that they've asked those types of questions. And I'll give you some examples of that. Um, Value, what I mean by that is, does the prospect believe that our product can solve the problem? Maybe we believe it, but do they? And what evidence can we look for to see that? And what stakeholders within the, the, the org you know, can, um, can potentially um, 
can potentially validate that for us. Um, our competitive position is often uh, sometimes a big surprise in the late stage of deals. Oh, they're just going to stick with their internal vendor. They said they'd build something for free or, you know, they're going to use XYZ because they've been around longer, whatever it might be. We tend to find those out well, on deals that we lost. We tend to find those out way too late for us to have something to, to do about it. And there is always something that we can do about it. The earlier we know where we truly st stand. The question I, I like to ask is, do you as a seller truly understand the choices your buyer has in solving problem X? And how are they ranking them? Because if you don't know that, you can't influence their thinking about why you're a better fit against those, those criteria. It's a big area for, for assessment and improvement in, in sort of how we run deals. Um, we uh, often don't leverage the influence that we might have and not individually us as sellers, but also our sales leaders, our CEOs and other investors or other people that might have relationships within the organization. But also if we have proof points with existing customers that are similar to the ones we're trying to sell now, and we can say, look, you, you, know, you, you guys look like you're six months behind this other company that looks just like you. Here's the process we followed with them and they're loving life right now. That allows us to translate into influence into their thinking process. And if organizations buy via RFP, a great way to do that is to package that knowledge into some templates that you can use to educate the, the buying organization on sort of the, the structure and framework of an RFP. So those are the basic tenets of the, the, the idea behind a deal review. And again, like I said, there are many frameworks that you can use whether it's medic or any other. So I'm going to uh, give you an example. Uh, again, this is calling on an old deal, uh, an old masterclass that I ran a couple of months ago. I made up a company called Great Software Systems and uh, Kira and I did a role play. We learned a lot in that role play, but uh, here's a good example where they're trying to sell. So this prospect's at this stage. Uh, they've got a marked close date of a month and a half from now. Um, in the assessment, I might, I might ask questions that help me understand where we've got gaps. And I found uh, in this deal review, like, you know what? They got to do something because they had a massive potential churn that they were able to avoid. And they've identified that what they built internally is failing. So they've got to replace it. And there's a good set of, of tools that they could use. We're high on their list. But we're working with some junior people, and I'm going to show you what I mean by that. And we haven't gotten access to the more senior individuals, um, even though we know that they uh, they know our customers and their executives in this organization, according to our person that's been working with us, our champion, uh, has said so. Similarly, um, we have proposed a trial to give them proof points that our product can solve their problem. But the AE hasn't sat down with the stakeholders and say, okay, well, what does success look like? How is it different and better than the current state? And who will sign off on a purchase decision once we exit this? So the post-trial process has to be really thought through and agreed upfront wherever possible. Um, similarly, uh, we, we, we see a gap in that by the way, I hope nobody works for service now. I just picked them randomly, but uh, love the company. But uh, you know, they're they don't solve this problem. They don't they don't pr provide a product offering in this this made up space. Uh, and we know that, but do we know that the key stakeholders that manage that relationship internally at our prospect know? Uh, and fu fundamentally, uh, we see these gaps. So one of the things that I'm a big uh, proponent of is using these power maps. And as I mentioned earlier on. Um, if your product needs consensus to buy, then um, building that consensus with the stakeholders, A, knowing who has to have that consensus and B, negotiating to get in front of those folks is really, really critical. So it turns out that we've been selling to this guy, Russ, and this guy, Nelson Baghetti, I think his nickname is Big Head. But, you know, so these folks are really positive on us in terms of the favorability to our product, but their influence is low to medium. 
when you think about their power and influence in the organization. Uh, there's a bunch of dashed lines, which indicates we haven't met with these people, but we know when we sell this product, we have to have at least consensus between marketing and product, if not product and engineering. And we've not been able to parlay these folks' enthusiasms to access to these people. So this is a good visual way of representing where we're strong, where we're weak, but also where we need to get to in order to build that consensus-based sell. Uh, so I, you know, I, I like to see sellers using tools like this. There's some interesting add-ons in HubSpot where you can actually do this and it sort of builds them automatically. Uh, so this is one, one tool that I think is really important to sort of vet um, the, um, the assessment. So when I run a deal review, I like to get the team together because the AEs that are covering their deals should be, you know, the other AEs whose deals aren't being covered should be there as well so they can listen and learn from the sort of uh, questions that we might ask, right? So I might ask, where are our gaps and what can we do about it? Why hasn't our champion gotten us in front of the, the power sponsors yet? Uh, you know, who is the exec sponsor, who it might be? And, and fundamentally asking questions with respect to where we're forecasting uh, a given deal. So uh, I mentioned earlier that there's, a, there's another way of thinking about uh, assessing why an organization might act, act. And this is just an example, but the urgency signals that companies might uh, display that we, if we're picking up on, we can, or if, if we have a way to ask, we can, we can assess if the organization can describe the impact of not addressing the problem that our product can solve, that's a good signal. If they've actually deployed capital against solving it, and what I mean by deployed capital means they put people or tools or both against it. Maybe they had engineering build something or another product team uh, build something, or maybe they actually bought something else, but it wasn't working. Um, so if I see these two signals, uh, I'm going to feel pretty confident that they've got to do something because the problem is still there and it's festering, especially if I see or see evidence that senior leadership has some level of engagement and involvement, involvement in solving this problem. Um, another way of thinking about that is there, this business impact is creating a mandate, like uh, in the role play example we did back in January, the example was, oh my God, we, we can't afford churn risk. So we got to do something about it. They're not always going to be that apparent, but as sellers, we've got to do our best to sort of uncover those. Um, and uh, just for, for people's benefit, I like to define what I mean when I say champion. Um, so everyone else, you may have great definitions as well. This is just mine. Um, I like to see folks who are biased first and foremost. They just like our offering, whatever it is the most, and they are convinced that we're the ones that, that uh, can solve it. And if we suspect an individual could be a champion, we want to nurture them. If we see this signal develop and if we see it get enriched over time, that's a good sign. But they also know they can't buy it on their own, so they've got to go out and find uh, the other stakeholders, whether it be individuals in their hierarchy or other people in the organization. Um, and I'm a, also a big believer in their actions or what describe them as champions. Somebody who, who has all of these first two, um, whoops, but doesn't put us in front of power. They say, look, I got this. The, the CMO, she's told me I'm the one who's got to get this signed or get this evaluated. We'll get you in front of them when, when time is coming. But then meanwhile, she's working with our competitor and we just don't have sight to it. That's not a champion. Um, similarly, they're, you know, if they're not doing homework to figure out if they don't know how to buy software and they're not doing that homework, then they're not a champion, right? Uh, that doesn't mean we'd stop working with them. It just might, means that we have got to find ways to broaden our base of support within the organization. And it may end up being that this individual's boss becomes our champion if we can get in front of them in the right way. Um, so these are big uh, aspects of of, um, of the assets that we can use when we're doing deal reviews and really diving deeply into our opportunities. I, will, I wanna end with one, one uh, slide and that is oftentimes um, when we're doing these reviews, we uncover gaps in our seller assets 
that are hampering our seller's ability to be effective in a nurturing a champion relationship. For example, case studies, proof points, uh, you know, uh, whatever, white papers, any other content that shows our thought leadership in our space, that gives them confidence and trust that we, we know what they need probably better than they do, will en enrich their ability to push us out into the ecosystem and the organization. And I see a lot of times gaps in our ability to do that. Similarly, I see a lot of gaps in our ability to position effectively against competition, whether it's competing against different approaches or specifically different vendors and their approaches. So, uh, you know, those of you who are in the marketing function or in the product marketing or in product uh, functions that's supporting the sales function, uh, you have a very important role in enriching all of those assets. Uh, and for those of you who are interested, and I'm happy to share this later, I have a library, like I'm a big uh, proponent of competitive positioning and templates and all kinds of other things that, that if we make sure that we have those gaps plugged, then we can really drive these deal reviews and we can say, you know what, we're weak here, we're weak here, we're weak here, we've got these amazing assets, assets, let's put them to work and let's get them to, you know, to the table with AEs on real deals so we can start to make these improvements. And fundamentally, at the end of the day, when we, we sort of put all these sorts of things together, where we want to end up is we now have stages uh, a rigorous cadence set up. We now have a mechanism for vetting deals. We have a better set of consistent criteria around how we forecast and, uh, and make projections to leadership, to the senior execs, to the board, um, and that we know how to fine tune each of these uh, to look at gaps in our seller assets, to look at gaps in our skills, to you know make some tough decisions in some cases and moving people out. Uh, or into different roles if, if, uh, if their skills gaps aren't you know uh, fixable. So um, ideally, if we put all these sorts of processes in place, then we'll have the ability to run it in a, a much more effective uh, manner. And um, yeah, let me stop there. And uh, I haven't been looking at the chat. Uh, so yeah, if, I'll jump in if, uh, really quickly, Kieran. Yeah. So um, there's a great question in the chat, which is, is urgency something we can create as an AE or is it intrinsic about the deal? And I know you've talked about it a little bit, but I think the sub question is, if urgency is not intrinsic in the deal, are there things that we can do to create it? Yeah, I think uh, the number one is that... Um, a lot of times, and it's not it's not always going to work. A lot of times, uh, organizations or individuals within organizations are sort of resigned that there's no good solution. Uh, maybe they've tried some things and they haven't uh, succeeded. So if you go back to those sort of urgency drivers, um, uh, whoops, sorry, I meant to type 18 in the slide, not in the Zoom chat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you go back to these urgency drivers and you think about it, uh, if we've if we've detected that they've tried something before, uh, our ability to use reference stories, proof points, other thought leadership content that describe similar orgs that you know had to take a similar journey uh, is a very good way of of amplifying urgency and painting that art of the possible picture. It's not always going to work. But uh, that's one, you know, that's one, I think, effective way of doing it. And obviously, be very uh, curious to hear what other folks think uh, with respect to some of those other urgency signals. Any other questions from folks on the line? All right, here we go. Um, as an early stage seed founder, where founder-led sales is still part of the process, should um, both founders be on calls or is divide and conquer better? I'm, uh, uh, I'm of the mind that uh, founders uh, should be on calls, depending upon how, how, how many people you have in the sales organization, obviously, uh, is an important aspect of it. But um, 
if you've hired one or two or three sellers, um, but your skill set and knowledge and practitioner experience is still key to winning the deals, then it is probably something where you're going to have to still be on there to sort of do some knowledge transfer of your secret sauce as a founder to equip them with the, the messaging. Because remember, they're not going to have that intersection of, you know, uh, experience as a practitioner. I, I saw the problem. I built a product to solve it. I won the first customers. All that stuff is now in your head and translating it about it out into the field is very much um, critical knowledge transfer process. And if you step away from the steering wheel too soon, you might find that you're going to have to rush back in because, oh, they haven't picked up on some of these key distinguishing characteristics of why our product's different or, or what have you. So I don't know if that uh, answers your question, but that's kind of the way I would think about that with respect to awesome. the question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's another one. What um, what automation have you seen around Salesforce pipeline classifications, you know, commit upside? Um, the, I think based on the criteria laid out, it's probably more focused on input from the AE, which may be more manual and thus fall into the constant review component. So, you know, I guess what else have you seen Salesforce specifically be able to do from a platform perspective to help aid in this review? Uh, I think uh, Salesforce and HubSpot both have the ability to set up uh, custom for forecast categories and timeframes. So you might say I do monthly forecasts or I do quarterly. Um, and you can base it on, for example, stage uh, entry or exit criteria, uh, which then allow you to overlay a management judgment on it. So the AEs and sales manager produce a forecast using the automation but there's a mechanism whereby maybe the sales VP or sales leader says, he or she says, I'm going to actually put management discretion on this one, that this one says commit, but I see a gap here or here after doing a deal review, I'm going to pull this down to say best case or stretch. So uh, I think if you have the stages set up correctly or, or consistently and people are using them and you've got the criteria set up and the what I would call the outcomes, then you can... Uh, more easily base the forecast on those, but you should always lever uh, leverage the tool's ability to put a management override judgment in and then use that as sort of the template on a forecast call so that you're applying those judgments sort of as and during the call. I don't know if I answered your question, but um, yep. yeah. That's great. Um, here's one, and and maybe you can answer, uh, and then maybe I can chime in too. But what level of forecasting pipeline information should be reported to the board level? Curious your thoughts there, Karen. Uh, that's a that's a uh, an excellent question. I think yeah. um, a lot of it is dependent upon sort of where you are in in your company's maturity. If you're a seed based. A uh, company where you've only won a the first handful of customers versus your A or B or C, and you've got you know you're scaling the thing and you're you're moving from five to twenty AEs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's going to be a lot different. I think they're going to the later stages. They want to see sort of trends in pipeline development. They're going to want to look at conversion rates from top of the funnel to opportunities, meaning how many meetings did we get, how many of them actually happened, how many of them convert into opportunities and over what time frame and how is this changing? Uh, so later stages will want to see that. Then they'll want to see opportunity to close one conversion. How is the sales cycle and time and stage changing? So more meta meta information about the pipeline and how it's changing over time as you get more sellers, as you get more customers and more proof points. Earlier stages, I think you want to show them the pipeline development work you're doing uh, how it matches to and marries to your sort of ICP and how you're able to sort of progress those into opportunities and deals. But uh, so the more, you know, the less mature you are in terms of an organization, I think the more you can be sort of open about pi uh, pipeline versus forecast. Um, as you get a little bit further on, you can talk about the pipeline in the aggregate in terms of count value, even though that's a little bit judgmental because early stage pipeline, you don't really know what the customer is going to spend yet. So generally speaking, I would say, uh, I would say that, and I'm happy to, to sort of dive into that in a little bit more detail. 
Yeah. I mean, the thing I'll just add as a seed stage investors here at Workbench and what we like to see on the board, um, I'll throw in chat um, a pipeline review kind of template that we've put together in the past and kind of the, the level of detail. I think uh, Kieran spot on, of course, at seed, it's very different than series C. At seed, we actually do like to see as much detail on the pipeline, uh, at least on some of the perhaps some of the deals that have progressed. I think the thing that people actually don't share enough and that I encourage our companies to share is actually also closed loss right? Like, why do you think we've lost a deal, right? Um, And it could be for a whole number of reasons. But when you're that early, actually having, I suppose, some process of elimination and saying, okay, well, we lost this deal because, you know, again, we couldn't find the champion or because there was no budget. All of those things um, are are really helpful. So um, great. And we've got another question here, which is, what are the best ways to identify champions within an organization? Obviously, each ICP really differs, right? Size, industry, or structure. Yeah. Uh, so I know you touched on that, but if you could talk a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, in the early stages, it's it's best because um, the 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 dynamics of selling to an individual, the same individual, multiple meetings, multiple sessions, et cetera, starts to create this sort of... Um, inertia whereby that individual starts to want to kind of keep their arms around it. And I find find that in our early engagements with prospects, for example, even on the first call, if they come in via the website or outbound and somebody says, yeah, I'll take a meeting, I, I encourage the companies I work with to maybe reach out to them and say, hey, do you have five minutes? I want to talk about the agenda. And before you even start working with them, just say, Generally speaking, who else in in your org is involved in looking at tools like this or technologies like this Um, and getting them to the table early because now you've you've sort of broadened the base of humans that you're engaging with at the earliest cycle. Whereas if you go too far with one individual, you may get sort of hamstrung later on. Um, And with that broader base of humans, you might start to detect different folks that could be uh, potential champions that you want to nurture over time. And you don't have to ask for permission as much because they've been sort of there since the start of the engagement. Great. Any other questions from folks? It's only time for one or two more. Cool. I think we've covered a lot today. And I know um, a lot of folks asked if we would have these uh, recordings, which we will. So um, I'm sure there'll be lots of follow from here. Over to you, Kira. Uh, Yes, thank you so much, Kieran. Uh, That was a great masterclass. You make everything sound super easy and effortless. So uh, for everyone on the call, you know, that is our goal is to help you be as easy and effortless at all of these things as Kieran is. Um, But yes, Jess just said we will be posting the recording um, and the slides on our blog. So check that out. Um, And then feel free to connect with Kieran directly on LinkedIn, which we have up on the screen. Additionally, if you're a pre-seed or C-stage enterprise startup and would like to chat through how you're thinking about go-to-market or, um, you know, anything in terms of your sales engine or flywheel, uh, feel free to reach out to us at vc at workbench.com because our Workbench team is happy to chat at any stage. Uh, Lastly, if you thought today's masterclass was helpful, we do have another sales masterclass coming up in May, specifically on how to pitch CIOs. So I will drop that Zoom link in the chat. There you go. Um, And with that, I I think we're all done. So thank you so much, Kieran, and we will see everyone on the next webinar. Thank you, everyone.